to me, the, the gravest mistake this country has made in my long life, it's not because I'm against Bush, although I am against Bush, but the gravest mistake this country has made is to elect a former CIA chief president of the United States. I think it's wrong to have the head of the secret police of the foreign secret police president of the United States because he has an oath and a loyalty to the CIA and it's many many criminal acts that transcends his sense of duty or his obligation to the country as a whole and the people as a whole there are more banks now in Panama than there are in almost any single country its size in the world and that includes Liechtenstein. Mm -hmm. And the banks all had to do with the drug business. And Noriega has a piece of all of those banks. Mm -hmm. And that could not have happened without the knowledge of George Bush in 1976. So now Bush and company are worried about the drug problem. They were part of the drug problem. Right. They were in the drug business. The CIA was in the drug business. The, the, the very heart of the CIA was to say, drugs for money for guns and the guns was to support the Contras against the legitimate government of Nicaragua. America's foremost maker of documentary films, Emil D'Antonio, takes a look at George Bush. We'll find out why he acts and thinks the way he does and what are those deep dark secrets he's trying to cover up. Right now on Alternative Views, Today on Alternative Views, we are very happy to have with us Emil D'Antonio, the filmmaker who has made the film on McCarthyism, Point of Order, the film on the Kennedy assassination, Rush to Judgment, the film on the Vietnam War in the Year of the Pig, the film on Nixon, <laughs> Millhouse, and many other films. Tomorrow, we're going to interview D'Antonio on his films and plan to produce a series of programs on his work as a filmmaker. Today, however, we want to discuss his political views, in particular, how he views George Bush in relationship to the other right-wing Republican political figures that he spent much of the last past decade studying and criticizing. How would you evaluate him? Well, Warren Hinkle and I uh, started a book of on Bush and we did a tremendous amount of research and uh, I, I think that it has to be said at the outset that George Bush is not a wimp. It would be easy for people on the left or progressives or Democrats or any number or combination of those to dismiss wi uh, Bush once and for all by saying he's a wimp, but he's not. And to misjudge the enemy is maybe worse than having no opinion at all uh, because I don't think that you become a naval pilot and get shot down and then fly more missions in fact quite a few more missions and I don't think that you uh, are as tough as he is I don't think the reason that he is to me ultimately dangerous is the year 1957 when he took over the CIA 75. 75. Right. I mean, I just twisted the numbers. Right. Sorry. Right. Uh, actually, it's 76. Yeah, 76. That's correct. <laughs> right. 
That's the correct or incorrect. Actually, we can, we can edit. <laughs> Why don't you just start over the... the oh, I'd rather have the mistakes, okay. wouldn't you? That's fine. I mean, I, I think the mistakes are part of life. Uh, I, I mean, you, you... I leave a lot of ours in, but some of them are so egregious, we have to... <laughs> it would be All right. Uh, anyway, but go ahead. This is fine. I think that when Bush became uh, director of the CIA in 1976, he was charged with one thing, which was to put that show back on the road, to clean it up, to make it tough again, and he did that. And in 1980, when he ran for president, there were over 180 CIA former officers who uh, wore Bush buttons and went all over the country wherever he ran, wherever he was speaking, and supported him into the New Hampshire primary when he finally did blow it. But uh, Were some of these the people who, the, you know, the worst mad dogs that the Carter administration and Stansfield Turner had kicked out? That's who they were. They were indeed mm -hmm. uh, the mad dogs. Uh, the CIA is com composed pretty largely of one kind of mad dog or another. I mean, uh, it isn't exactly uh, the Boy Scouts or the Ladies' <laughs> Village Improvement Society. Uh, but I, I think that Bush has been underestimated throughout. One thing is that he has what might even be called an upper-class demeanor, that softness that many upper-class people affect is frequently uh, misinterpreted as, as weakness. Well, he came up through this upper-class uh, uh, network of social clubs and uh, schools and all, so he, he was uh, right in there with the rest of them in, in this regard. I think that he separated himself from a part of his class by going to Andover instead of St. Paul's or St. Mark's or Groton, mm. which are the more social schools. Andover is probably the best United States at that time prep school for men, only, for boys only. Now it's uh, coeducational. But Andover was a school which uh, emphasized mind and emphasized the ability to deal with books and mathematics, etc. And I don't think Bush was a genius or anything. I don't think he was all that smart, but he was smart enough to do reasonably well at Andover. And it's a very, it's a very hard school. It still is. It's still the hardest preparatory school in the United States. To en it's the hardest one to enter. And more of its graduates go on to Harvard and Yale than almost any, than, than any other prep school in, in the United States. So, so it's a class. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. No, it's 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 part of a of a class structure and, and a class education and uh, something that leads you to have a, a mild rather than a loud or aggressive voice. And I think people c frequently construe an upper class quiet, m moderate voice as weakness, which of course it isn't. Uh, as I say, you're not a Navy pilot, you don't clean up the CIA, and uh, you don't conduct the rough and just even dishonorable campaign that he conducted against Dukakis without being somewhat of a tough guy. So that Bush is really a serious member of the upper class. He wasn't a playboy. He wasn't uh, frivolous. He was also the <coughs> son of a senator, Senator uh, Prescott, Prescott Bush, who had an enormous influence on him and who, were, who sort of preceded him along the political path that he later followed. Can we talk a little bit about Bush's family and Certainly. his relation to his father? You know, that his grandfather, too, began his own company out in Ohio mm. and was successful. So that Prescott Bush, his father, went to private schools, went to Yale, and the most important thing that happened to Prescott Bush in Yale is the most important thing that happened, say, also to Bill Buckley and to George Bush. Prescott Bush became a m member of Skull and Bones. It's impossible to understand what Skull and Bones is and what its thrust is unless you've really looked at it pretty hard. It's a, an extremely secret senior society, which means you are tapped, and you literally are tapped to join Skull and Bones. You are about 10 members of the senior class are tapped at the beginning of the senior year. Some are official. The editor of the Yale Daily News, the captain of the football team, and then some people who have exhibited leadership qualities, toughness, and it's a, an extremely tight, strange group in which an allegiance is sworn among each other that 
is far beyond this Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States. It goes beyond family, because your family is left behind in a sense. You go forward with skull and bones. It's not an accident that when Bush was vice president, he had a dinner in the White House for about 40 members of Skull and Bones. Skull and Bones is a secret, it's like the original German student society. Mm. The initiations are harsh. Some people think the initiations are homosexual even, as well as being harsh. But every member of Skull and Bones helps another. And it's, it's a, a prime loyalty. It's, an, it's a perfect upper class construct. And uh, it changes every person who goes through it. Now, Bush's father was in it. Now, Bush's father, there are two kinds of secrecy, I think, in the United States that the average person knows nothing about. One is the secrecy of a major private bank. Now, a private bank isn't like Chase Manhattan Bank. It's not like one of the big Texas banks, which is owned by stockholders and shareholders. A private bank is owned by no women, by a small group of men. The, the partners sometimes are as few as 15 or 20. And Prescott Bush was a member of Brown Brothers Harriman. Investment banks. Investment right, banks. Uh, I was telling Doug earlier that one example of the power of Brown Brothers, back in 1905, the currency of Nicaragua, the five centavo note, had on it a picture of a bearded gentleman who was none other than James Brown of Brown Brothers. He wasn't a Nicaraguan. He was the man who loaned money to Nicaragua at usurious rates of interest. And uh, it's the kind of loan that was guaranteed to break the back of any small third world country that did not have uh, an, in an industrial society. And Brown Brothers did this. Uh, they were international bankers. Each partner had a private sort of cubicle, and it was a partnership in the purest sense of that word, in that uh, the profits at the end of the year were divided among the partners. And the better, uh, the better of the, uh, those who were inferior to them were then given bonuses, but the bulk of the money was split. So Prescott Bush was extremely rich, and he lived in a city of great richness, Greenwich, Connecticut. And he trained his children in silence. And this is important when you think of George Bush. And he was a member of Skull and Bones as well. So that when Bush became, when Bush went to Yale and became a member of Skull and Bones, he was well groomed and well trained and well rehearsed in all of that. By the time he was at Yale, his father was a senator. And uh, his father had an extraordinary interest in and function in intelligence affairs. So you have something that's rare in this country, which is a long history in intelligence. I don't mean a long history of intelligence, <laughs> but in intelligence. And uh, to me, the, the gravest mistake this country has made in my long life, and it's not because I'm against Bush, although I am against Bush, but the gravest mistake this country has made is to elect a former CIA chief president of the United States. I think it's wrong to have the head of the secret police of the foreign secret police president of the United States because he has an oath and a loyalty to the CIA and it's many, many criminal acts that transcends his sense of duty or his obligation to the country as a whole and the people as a whole. So well, he is, yeah. he will. <clears throat> this uh, has been indicated by his involvement with the CIA and all of the drug operations in relationship to Central America and South America. Well, uh, certainly. I mean, uh, Bush was involved in that as vice president, mm -hmm. and uh, as president, he's denied it. Uh, I don't find that particularly uh, alarming. I mean, this is what one would expect. You could not expect Bush to admit that he was involved in drugs. You can't expect Bush to admit that he was connected with the drugs in Panama when he's just failed in a coup 
to have Noriega bumped off, uh, Noriega killed his predecessor by putting a bomb in his plane. His predecessor was an interesting man. Graham Greene, the English writer, went there and wrote a book called, I think, A Visit to a Dictator. <laughs> but, uh, but he was a benign dictator, and uh, he tried to help the people of his country, Panama. But Noriega had him, had a bomb, as I say, put a bomb in his personal airplane, and he blew up in midair. And Noriega took over. And it seems to me that if our country had been reasonable, we would have had a certain reluctance to uh, make a, a policy of accord with a man who had just murdered his predecessor. Um, Noriega, as you know, was a high living, big spender who was in drugs from the beginning. And all of our intelligence people knew it. But he was regarded as a stable, we have always looked for stable right-wing dictators in Central and South America. That is our policy. And we reaped what we sowed. We ended up by getting Noriega. Well, he was also um, a CIA asset, an intelligence chief, and he was on, on the payroll of the CIA. He was on the pay payroll of the CIA. He worked for the CIA. CIA. And under Noriega, something happened of great significance that tends to be omitted, which is there are more banks now in Panama than there are in almost any single country its size in the world, and that includes Liechtenstein. <laughs> And the banks all had to do with the drug business. And Noriega has a piece of all of those banks. And that could not have happened without the knowledge of George Bush in 1976. When he was head of the CIA. When he was head of the CIA. Noriega, right. and yes, he met with him, what, two or three times? Well, I mean, he denies ever having met with oh, him. Oh, yeah. So let's give him the benefit of the doubt, which I don't really, but let's just for the <laughs> sake of... Well, he admits, there's on record... He's that he on record that he met it twice. Yeah. yeah. But he denied it anyway. Mm. <laughs> but what you have that's just as important as Bush meeting with him is his chief deputy when he was head of the CIA was a man named uh, Admiral Daniel Murphy, number two person in the CIA, who met with Noriega frequently. And Admiral, uh, in 1982, when, Re when Bush was vice president, he was appointed... Uh, head of the South Florida Drug Task Force. His deputy there was again Admiral Daniel Murphy. Oh, Murphy oh. made many trips to Noriega. And that was the time at which you had the real burgeoning of banks. I mean, uh, Panama had no reason to have many banks. The people were poor people. Uh, there was a small upper class. And uh, the Americans who were there had their own banks and their own compounds. So that suddenly banks became very popular because all tons and tons of drug money were being emptied uh, into Panama. And we're not talking about just mom and pop banks. We're talking about... Uh, no, we're talking about very big deals. The big New York, uh, Wall Street banks. And the banks Wall Street and, and New York banks, of course, are the banks that finally serviced all this money. The money would go into a Panamanian bank, and then it would be wired to New York, and then it would go somewhere else. We saw this in our own country, in Miami. Miami was never particularly noted for banks until the drug system became fully operational. And then, you know, there are all those stories which are true of people going into a bank in Miami with a, with a bushel basket or a paper sack three feet high full of $100 bills and say, deposit this. And the bank would charge them immediately 2% for counting it. And 2% of $100,000 is $2,000 for an hour's work. And then instead of paying interest, they would charge them to hold the money. So that every, you know, the great thing about the drug business is that everybody made out except the poor user of drugs. But uh, the banks made out, the drug, the big dealers made out, the little dealers made out. And the sucker on the street who used cocaine and all the rest of it, uh, he didn't do too well. Indeed, it's significant to note that The Nation published an article on the political economy of cocaine. And they indicated that before George Bush, 
took over as drug czar when he was vice president for Reagan, that the federal government was cracking down on these banks, was stopping drug trade by regulating the banks and stopping the flow of drug money. As soon as Bush became drug czar in 1982, they stopped this policy. They went into interdiction. They went into trying to capture boats off of Florida to patrol the border along uh, Mexico. And this just helped the big cocaine cartel that could smuggle in the drugs into this uh, country and that had the wherewithal um, to do it and then had free banks. Oh, there's no doubt about that. And, and without that, without the banks, the drug industry would have died mm -hmm. because they really needed banks to accept and launder the money. And large, proper U.S. banks did precisely that. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's not an accident, of course, that uh, all that money was then recycled in one form or another to go back and help the Contras. Well, this is the other link here. The reason the Reagan administration and Bush were so tolerant to big drug dealers and people like Noriega, who were obviously involved in drug trafficking, but were also helping them with an illegal supply operation to the Contras. This seemed to be the obsession of the Reagan administration that Bush went along with completely. We saw an article, I forget which was, uh, one in Playboy or some others, a series of articles, where they said that uh, in order to get Noriega to play ball with him Nor and uh, to keep uh, from, to give Noriega protection and immunity from being hassled and arrested perhaps, or assassinated, he had to agree to give a certain percentage, two or three percent, whatever, off the top of his gross receipts to support the country. <laughs> So that's one of the reasons that Noriega said, well, I've got uh, Bush by the balls. So it's, I thought it was so funny, all during this business of the uh, failed coup in Panama, where they said, gosh, why didn't George Bush just go in there and get Noriega and bring him out and put him on trial? You know, this is terrible. They should've... That's the last thing George Bush wants to do, is to put Noriega on trial. But the mistaken <laughs> put, on the other hand, is almost as bad as a trial, in the sense that Noriega has a hold on this country and on this administration and it's got to be deposited in a Swiss bank somewhere, plus in his own mind and, and tongue. And uh, he has uh, the capacity to blackmail a fair number of major U.S. players, including, I would suspect, the president of this country. For sure, Daniel Murphy and many others. To me, one of the most pathetic things, uh, most, one of the most pathetic events in our time, of recent time, were the Kerry hearings, which was the most exciting and dramatic hearing I've seen on television since Watergate or since the Army McCarthy hearings. And it was relegated to a cable channel. It was relegated to a CNN. C-SPAN. C-SPAN. Right. And uh, which is a very, you know, a channel most people do not watch. And you can't watch it unless you have cable. And these hearings went on. They're, they're, the, the, the outcome is published in four for the, the outcome is published in four volumes, uh, which you can buy from the U.S. government printing office. But to see these young Americans on camera, to see a young Cuban on camera who's saying, well, uh, I was in my Learjet at takeoff. Uh, Carrie said, how much money did you have with you? He said, oh, oh I don't know, 5.4 mil. Uh, I was on my way down to Panama, and uh, the police arrested me, and... They took my money, and I've been given 30 years, and that's why I'm talking, hoping to get a smaller sentence. And then to see an American, a young, a good-looking American guy, maybe 24, 25, say, I started running uh, a little boat of, uh, down to Central America, in eight, maybe into Colombia, and I'd get marijuana. And I made, you know, $30,000 on one trip. Then I got a bigger boat, and I made $500,000. And then I realized that marijuana really wasn't the right drug to bring in anyway. So I bought an airplane, and I learned how to fly it. I used to fly into Colombia, and I would bring in... The, and these people were flying right into the U.S., one after the other. These people were finally arrested, but all of them had one, two, three years' experience. One uh, person who was arrested was a transplanted Cuban who worked out of the Barbados. Uh, not Barbados, uh, uh, the island right across Cuba. Uh, Jamaica? No. Anyway. 
But anyway, the Bahamas. Uh, the Bahamas, uh -huh. absolutely. Uh -huh. There's a whole uh -huh. chapter on the Bahamas. Uh -huh. This is the Bahamas was considered the great drug import center uh -huh. for the whole uh, uh, United States, for the entire United States. And one of these people said, "Well, you know, I used uh, motorboats, small, fast motorboats, go from the Bahamas right into Miami." And he said, "You know, on a Sunday afternoon, there are 50,000 boats out there. The family dentist and everybody else has a boat." So I have 10 boats filled with drugs. So if one of my guys got busted, well, I could buy them out after a few months and pay them well. But nine would get through. So now Bush and company are worried about the drug problem. They were part of the drug problem. Right. They were in the drug business. The CIA was in the drug business. The, the, the very heart of the CIA was to say drugs for money for guns. And the guns was to support the Contras against the legitimate government of Nicaragua. And this has been going on a long time. There's no greater disease in American life than the madness of anti-communism. Because Nicaragua was never a threat to the United States. It was never communist. Either. And it was never truly communist. If you think that Cuba is communist, Cuba, how could Cuba be a threat to the United States? Our radar is so good that if a plane took off and came close, we'd blow it out of the sky. Could, do they have the troops to invade us? The answer is no. Um, the United States has also not understood, I think, a fundamental question about most of these countries, which is that they're nationalist more than they are communist or Marxist. They're nationalist in that the United States, Fidel Castro is the first person to rule Cuba in modern times, modern history, going back 300 years, who was a Cuban. First you had the Spanish, and then you had the Americans, and then you had Fidel. Even if you hate Fidel, and I don't, but even if you do, you have to admit he's the first Cuban. And the same thing is true in Nicaragua. We bought all those other people in Nicaragua. Uh, one president after another. We armed them, we gave them great money, personal wealth, and Ortega is the first ruler of Nicaragua who is truly a Nicaraguan and not somebody in the pay of the United States. And he's not in the pay of the Soviet Union, which can't afford to pay anybody very much. He's a, I would, I would call Ortega a patriot, patriot, as I would call most of his enemies, people who represented a bankrupt class which exploited the rest of the people. You, uh, I'm making too many speeches. I'm <laughs> well, you have so That's many right. interesting uh, <clears throat> topics to uh, discuss. What I thought we might do now is to go back and look into the roots of George Bush's involvement in the intelligence com community. You made an interesting point that Bush's uh, father and Bush were members of Skull and Bones. That was a secret society that was dedicated to secrecy, secret bonds, oaths, and that Bush's training in his family trained him that secrecy was of primary um, value. And the banking business. And the banking business is another secret organization that his uh, father uh, participated in. At one time, you had an idea that when Bush was involved in Texas oil business, he might have had intelligence connections and involvements. And indeed, his beginning in the Texas oil business after he returned home from World War II had some connections with Skull and Bones. Do you want to elaborate on this? Yeah. These connections. I'd like to go back one okay, step. Sure. Um, Bush's father was uh, an officer in the First World War, the 1914 to 1918 war. And part of his training took place at Fort Sill, Indiana. Uh, Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Uh, Oklahoma where uh, two of his closest Skull and Bones friends went with him as young, uh, young officers. One of them a key person in George Bush's life was Neil Mallon. By the way, both Prescott Bush and Neil Mallon not only served in the field artillery, but also in intelligence in World War I. So you have a, a hereditary connection to intelligence. When they came out, uh, Mallon went to Texas and uh, with very little money, he bought a piece of a semi-bankrupt company that he formed and became one of the big corporations in Texas the dresser industries. Oh, yeah. 
Now, when George Bush left, George Bush having been a pilot and entered Yale, then having been enlisted as a pilot at age 18, after having been shot down and, and then returning to Yale and taking his degree, decided that he and his wife and young child would drive to Texas in their floppy old car, and they did. And they sought out Neil Mallon. And Neil Mallon gave George Bush a job in dresser industries. And Bush says in his campaign autobiography, and Mallon also confirms it, that the job was essentially, the first job was sort of sweeping the place to learn something about the business and then going up. And then Bush decided to become uh, an oil player here in Texas. And he, with Mallon's help, he did. And it's no accident that when his next child was born, the child was named Neil Mallon Bush. Now, it is my unprovable conclusion that you can't prove much about the activity of intelligence people. The whole gambit is to keep it secret. I think that Mallon, who had been in intelligence in World War I, carried on a kind of freelance intelligence after World War I, and as he built up dresser industries into being quite an enormous corporation. And I think, and I may be alone in the whole United States in this, I think that Bush acquired, George Bush acquired, sometime in the early 1950s through Neil Mallon, a connection with the CIA. The CIA is something about which we know nothing. It was constructed that way, it's meant to be that way, and it's not very easy. You cannot get anything from the Freedom of Information Act. The FBI is bad enough. I applied to both the CIA and the FBI for any files they might have held on me. The FBI at least gave me, you know, quite a few thousand pages, but the CIA would give me many pages in which everything was blacked out but my name, something I was quite familiar with. So that, uh, you know, there it was. Uh, they, the CIA never yielded anything, and to this day it has never yielded anything under the Freedom of Information Act, and to this day its primary uh, concern is secrecy. So you can't ever prove, I could be just a liar and make this up about Bush, and they would not deny it. And I could even prove it maybe, and they would not deny it. They would have no comment, because the CIA is not stupid. It's clever enough to know that denial constitutes a form of uh, acceptance, of agreement. So they have no answer to give. And if you were to write for the files of George Bush and the CIA in the 1950s, they would respond with, there is no answer. But we do know something that in the 1950s, with the help of Neil Mullen, George Bush founded the Zapata Oil Corporation. We know that that had corporate headquarters in Texas and was very active all around the Caribbean, precisely the place that the CIA was interested in at that uh, time. We also know in 1963, after the Kennedy assassination, a memo turned up from J. Edgar Hoover to George Bush asking him about the results of his survey of the community, the Cuban exile community, and how they were responding to the Kennedy assassination. So there's a piece, uh, some evidence at least, circumstantial and actual, that links Bush to the intelligence community during that period when he was an oil man in Texas. Uh, uh, we also know that the CIA for many years has used uh, various uh, organizations, corporations, multinational corporations as either fronts right. or just as, as a source of information and cooperation. Right. So it's not, it, it's not, not surprising. True. It's not a bureaucratic dis distinction, but those corporations are regarded as assets. Whereas it's my contention that mm -hmm. Bush was an officer. Mm -hmm. And in the CIA language, there's an enormous difference. Right. Yes. I mean, an asset could be any flag-waving businessman who uh, uh, you're going to Germany, you're going to open a, a, a business there. We'd be interested if you'd report along these lines, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and then there'd be certain specific things that were not. But as an officer, you would go in there with the capability to hire other people to perform acts, even violent acts, to suborn other people, to bribe them, to conduct the kind of policy that, Let's face it, that all intelligence groups, whether they be the U.S. or British or Soviet or Chinese or Cuban, 
do. This is what intelligence groups do. They, they hire people to commit acts of sabotage. Uh, uh, it was uh, somebody Bush knew who put a bomb into a Cuban airplane and killed 53 people. It was somebody who had, who was probably a vague asset of the CIA. And Bush's connections, as you quite rightly pointed out, with the Caribbean became a major point of interest for the United States, because after all, Cuba is over there on that other side. Uh, and as I say, this all seems like something conjectural. You can't prove. You can never prove that a spy is a spy until you put him before a firing squad and he's willing to speak it. But even most spies of quality prefer to die rather than, than to say anything. This is the history that the British established long before we had any spies. Dee, let's move towards George Bush's entry into uh, <laughs> politics. Uh, he was the son of Prescott Bush, who was the senator of Connecticut, was a, who became Twice. a quite powerful uh, senator. His father also went to Yale, as did Bush. His father was also in Skull and Bones and the Whippenpoo Society, as was Bush. His father also played first base for Yale, as was as Bush. did Bush. Uh, his father had intelligence connections in World War I, as we are suggesting um, Bush did. So there was obviously a big influence of the father on the uh, son. George followed Prescott's footsteps pretty closely. Moreover, George um, decided to run for politics, possibly as a CIA asset or operative moving into the political field. What is your theories about uh, these connections? Well, uh, he started running for office in Texas. Let's uh, be as candid mm -hmm. as we can from an oil district. Right. And he failed. Right. Uh, he was elected, after failing, he was elected to Congress, but then he wanted to be elected to the Senate, and uh, he was defeated by Yarborough, who was a liberal Texan. Then down the road, it looked as if Yarborough, Yarborough's reputation was turning sour among the people of Texas, and Bush decided to run against him. But then out of the blue appeared our friend who ran for the vice presidency with Dukakis. Lloyd Benson. Lloyd uh, Benson. Right. And who, who ran against Yarborough, so that Bush, having spent a fortune thinking he was going to beat Yarborough, I mean, Yarborough would take the Democratic nomination, and. Instead, Benson, of course, beat Yarborough up in the Democratic primary with so a vicious, with a vicious with red a vicious baiting red campaign. campaign. Yeah. And then you had the tightest race in the history of Texas, which was Benson against Bush, and each one of them spending more money than anybody had ever spent to run for the Senate, and Bush lost. By and how much? Right? By a, a, a tiny, tiny number of votes. Oh, it was the that closest, close? closest race ever held for the hmm. Senate in the state of Texas. And Benson said Bush was too liberal. And was, Benson said uh, that Bush was too liberal. <laughs> Benson was running as a true conservative. At, at this point, uh, Nixon decided to help old young Bush out, I was going to say old boy Bush out, mm. and he appointed him... Uh, ambassador to the UN, I Ambassador. For, he, he gave him two appointments. Mm. First, ambassador to the United mm. Nations. Right. And uh, Bush wasn't very comfortable with that. He didn't like being in New York, among other things. Then he became ambassador to China, and then he had the job that was really quite interesting. He became chair of the Republican National Committee, and he was in that job when Watergate broke out. And uh, he, he, there are two famous letters that George Bush wrote to Nixon. One is, no matter how this comes out, I will back you to the end. And the second one is, it really grieves me to write such a letter but I would think you would do more of a service to your country and to your party if you resigned. And uh, so Bush <laughs> flopped, uh, flip-flopped on that. And uh, of course, Nixon left. And shortly after that, Ford, or a year and a half after that, Ford appointed Bush then to become head of the CIA. Right. Which was a curious appointment. The CIA people wanted somebody strong who must have had some experience with the CIA. Otherwise, you would have to believe that the CIA, which was really under tremendous problems because of post-Vietnam activity, there were, there were investigations of the Phoenix program, 
as you know, the Phoenix program permitted one CIA person and one Vietnamese to say that you were a Viet Cong and they could blow you away and had the right to kill you. It was the right to kill people. We admitted that we killed about 25,000 people in the Phoenix program. The Vietnamese claim it was closer to 400,000, and nobody will know what the answer is. And I suspect myself that it was probably somewhere in between, and I'm not a liberal. But, uh, uh, but um, Bush was then well ensconced uh, into the heart of the National Republican Party, and uh, he uh, obviously eyed the presidency. And in the beginning, he was a favorite to beat Reagan in 1980. Well, it's also significant that Bush was the candidate of the uh, top people of the American power structure, David Rockefeller and all of those groups. Uh, been, uh, and a tremendous number of CIA people. Mm -hmm. And he had been in the uh, Trilateral Commission, and he had all these upper-class connections. And Reagan was just this uh, rank outsider, the crazy man from the right, and so that when Reagan won, the establishment folks freaked out and then tried to come up with this special arrangement where uh, um, they would have Kissinger really running the country and uh, uh, Bush uh, up there as the, as, the, as the head man really doing things behind the scene. And Reagan balked at that, so they finally came up with a compromise where Bush would be vice president. And it turns out that the not so wimpy Bush, as you said, turned out to be the real heavy in the White House, running all of these covert operations and keeping Let's them going. Let's talk about that. I mean, Bush was a very heavy player in the Absolutely. Reagan administration. What are some of the things that he was doing? Well, uh, there is nothing that took place in South, in Central America, mm -hmm. that Bush was not involved in, and Central America is really the the primary emphasis in that period. It's not only the Contras, it was anti-Cuban stuff, it was uh, uh, the, our war uh, supporting the government of El Salvador. It, uh, is, it was essentially South America, and uh, Bush had access to all the CIA people. It was like the, the head of the CIA was suddenly planted in the White House. He had Donald Gregg, he had... There, there's nobody sort of wilder in the history of the CIA who was reporting to the White, to the White House and Bush than a guy named Rodriguez. Felix Rodriguez. Felix Rodriguez, as opposed to Chi Chi and the others. <laughs> uh, but Felix Rodriguez invented a new kind of way to kill people in Vietnam. It took a lot of courage. Rodriguez had a lot of guts and uh, he did the most dangerous work you can think of and he did it well and it's too bad it was probably the most immoral idea anybody ever had but it still took courage i mean life is a contradictory idea and it would be great if all the villains were cowards but they aren't and rodriguez was a hero in the wrong cause but what he would do is fly a very light airplane and he would find vc as they call it national liberation front positions and he would hang in long enough to call in the bombers who would then come in and bomb those positions and kill the people. And he did the same thing in Central America. And uh, he went to the White House. He was a friend of, of a close friend of Donald Gregg's, who was Bush's closest friend, the man who just this year was made ambassador to Korea with a lot of struggle and a lot of... But of course the Democrats... Elliot Abrams. No, no, no. You're talking yeah, about... Yeah. No. I mean Gregg, excuse Donald me. Donald Gregg. I mean... Okay. Yeah. Uh, the Democrats in the Senate have never been known for courage because they should have, <laughs> they should have blocked that nomination. Oh, boy. I mean, Greg was no more fit to be an ambassador uh, than I am. And I was a communist when I was 16 years old, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, uh, so I'm rambling on. So well, I, well, the, 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 <laughs> I think the, the key event here is that it was alleged, at least in the Rolling Stone magazine, that George Bush 
was put in charge of this Black Eagle operation. Yeah. There was an illegal supply operation to the Contras to get them arms that would circumvent the scrutiny of the uh, uh, Congress, and that he brought in at that time Donald Gregg Dragon. to run this uh, Central America Contra supply operation. Gregg, in turn, hired Felix Rodriguez, his old buddy from, from Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam. So you had a CIA military operation being run out of George Bush's office. When Eugene Hassenfuss's plane was shot down, who was part of this supply operation in October of 1986, um, he had in his notebook Don Gregg's Don Gregg. telephone's number, Felix Rodriguez, and the first person that was called when the Felix Rodriguez called when the plane was shot down was Don uh, uh, Gregg. And I guess Sam Watson, who was his assistant, took the phone call. Colonel Watson, right. Yeah, so that uh, Bush's office was heavily involved in this uh, illegal uh, Contra supply operation. It was the same drug operation, the same yeah. operation that we talked about earlier with Noriega that was running illegal uh, drugs. Well, it was the only yeah. way to get money yeah. to buy the arms right. that would, supp that would uh, support our right-wing forces in Nicaragua. Right. I mean, it put the White House itself in the drug business. Right. Because they were, the arms would go down, but then the drugs the would drugs come came back, back. This is in the they, same plane. The, the most astounding single tale in the Kerry Commission is this one pilot who said, now, where do you want me? He, he, he brought down the arms, and he had a whole uh, DC-4, a four-engine plane. He said, where do you want me to land? And they said, Homestead Air Force Base. Well, the idea of a pilot landing at Homestead in Florida, which is an Air, United States Army Air Force Base. Air, Army Air Force is from my <laughs> That's World War II. Time. World War II. It's, it's, uh, Air Force. Air Force Base. <laughs> when he landed, there was no problem. He, he, he told the tower he was coming in, and to me, the, almost the greatest cinematic thing there is, is, is I used to be a pilot, and when you land, there's a truck there with a big sign lit up that says, follow me. So there was the, the Jeep, it was not a truck, there was the Jeep saying, follow me. And it took him into a hard stand, and he parked his, his plane full of drugs and left which would lead one to assume that somebody connected with the Air Force or else a private contractor came and emptied, unloaded, what would probably be several tons of drugs, enough to keep the streets of New York, Boston, Los Angeles, and Houston going for a long time. Not to mention Wall Street. And Not to mention Uppies. Wall Street and, and Beverly Hills and the movie industry <laughs> right. and the rich and all the users of high-grade cocaine. And the, the irony of this is, at the same time, Bush is named drug czar of the Reagan administration. He was. So at the same time that his Central America operation is smuggling drugs into this country in unprecedented numbers, he's supposed to be in charge of the war on drugs that the Reagan administration and later Bush has exploited for political ends. He was, a tru he was truly a drug czar, finally. So, yeah, right. <laughs> so. Well, now, the Oliver North operation was going on parallel, parallel. to this. But then George Bush would have to step in and uh, cool things when Oliver North was having trouble with uh, uh, Donald Gregg and Felix Rodriguez. Well, you know, the uh, right wing of our country always uses the word conspiracy about those who disagree with it. But if there was ever a first-rate conspiracy, a massive conspiracy in the history of our country, it was in the White House. And, and Reagan did not... We now know that Reagan had some idea of what was going on. But Reagan was not a hands-on president. Uh, he, fa he couldn't even remember the names of his secretary of state or, or high officials. Yeah. So that he wasn't totally connected with this, but he was made aware of it. But there it was in the White House under George Bush and Donald Gregg and other senior officers of the State Department and the CIA. And we were, and now, we, you know, we are, not, we are now talking about drugs in the streets and people dying and ODing and the, we have a drug culture beyond measure, but you can't say it began in the White House, but it certainly was very big in the White House. It was the White House that made it possible. Had the Reagan administration really said, this is the end, we're going to close it down, it could have been closed down. I no longer think it can be closed down because there are just too many people involved. I was in Los Angeles at the home of a person I cannot mention. He's a major player in the film industry. 
and in his house he has eight or ten collector's items of 18th century English silver. And each one of them is filled with the most expensive cocaine you can buy. Hmm. And it's there for the guests to take and snuff. And, uh, and this is standard now, I mean not that is standard, but the use of cocaine is standard among all classes of people in this country. The poor die from it because they get inferior cocaine. Uh, they get, in, in some cases, cocaine that's been mixed with poison, either intentionally or by mistake. And the rich get very pure first-class cocaine. I don't think there's even anybody among the young people in this room who doesn't know somebody who hasn't used cocaine. Uh, and you, you can't say that Bush is responsible for it. I mean, that's too much. You can only say that Bush shares a very profound responsibility. And it's time that he turned his back on that responsibility. So, I mean, it may be too late to stop it, but it's not too late to make an effort. So it's, it's absurd that now as President of the United States, Bush declares another war, the war on, on drugs. drugs because he was so responsible for having connections with so many players in the drug world when he was uh, Reagan's uh, vice uh, president. Of course, it gives them a good opportunity to do away with a lot of civil liberties and do away, hopefully, with a lot of opposition. I, I hope think. exploiting Absolutely, the drug certainly. issue. Uh -huh. How would you evaluate the mass media coverage of all this that we've been talking about? Cowardly. Cowardly, basically. Well, why do you think that is? Here, an enormous story, far bigger than Watergate ever was, and yet they hushed it up. Well, I think, uh, I think the main reason for that is class interest, frankly. And they are the people who put Bush in, the media people. They're the people who supported Bush and who supported Reagan. And uh, in a sense, it's to admit their own culpability in, in, a, in a reflexive, secondary way, but nonetheless a kind of culpability. And uh, it's to admit error, which the press and the media, the, the media no longer admit error, I mean error. Uh, TV has gone soft and the great gray papers like the New York uh, Times and the Washington Post, they, they don't deal with this. The Times would have an occasional page 10 story about the okay. Contras and drugs where they said the sources were merely convicted drug dealers as if yeah. the story really didn't have all that much uh, credence to it and they never connected Bush with all this. Well, to me, is, I go back to the yeah. Kerry Commission, mm -hmm. Kerry Committee. The Kerry Committee report is as good a report on drugs as will be made by this government, and it's a first-class report. And uh, it covers everything. It covers uh, the Bahamians. It covers uh, uh, all of Central America. It, can, it covers Colombia. It covers Americans. It covers all kinds of people who have flown back and forth. It, it covers pilots and big-time distributors, people who owned many, many planes, etc. And nobody, nobody picked up on this. As I said, it was broadcast on C-SPAN. It would appear as a small story in the New York Times and the Washington Post. But the basic thrust of what Kerry uncovered is still there. It should be, and it was published by the, obviously by the government printing office in a small printing, and very few people bought it. You can still pick up the phone now and order the four volumes, mm. and they are staggering. Mm. You have enough there to bring down a government. And, and Kerry himself seems to have lost his courage, and he's a very brave man, Kerry, but he seems to have lost something. I mean, I know one of the reasons, and you hate to say this in public, <laughs> uh, so I won't. <laughs> well, since you laugh, I will. Uh, I mean, his wife and children left him, I mean, because he was having an affair with a major Hollywood star, Michelle Pfeiffer. And uh, it took away some of his efficiency. But Kerry was remarkable. He was the most decorated naval officer in the, in the Vietnam War. And the first thing he did when he came back home was join Vietnam veterans against the war. Right. And that's a remarkable position. I mean, you know, it takes courage to fight in a war, but it takes more courage to come back and do that. And then to have the skill to be elected to the Senate in the state of Massachusetts was an extraordinary achievement. And to do the hearings was an extraordinary achievement. And to let them drop 
makes you wonder, you know, is he being, people see him as a, as a new Jack Kennedy, people see him as a presidential candidate. See, the media completely ignored him, so the even the if media, he continued you know, to pursue this to the maximum, he might have been bumping his head against the wall because he wasn't getting any response. The media completely covered this up. Well, I want to know what was wrong with America. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was that he was, his show going on, uh, not C-SPAN, but uh, CN, I mean, uh, C-SPAN, right. seen by the smallest possible audience that the other media, ABC, NBC, CBS, never picked up on. Right. They would have the slightest reference to it. And it was, the, it was as big as the Army McCarthy hearings. It right. was as big as Watergate. And when people say the war on drugs, et cetera, et cetera, this is the greatest menace to the, it strikes at the very heart of this country. I mean, this is only two years ago. Why didn't somebody just, why, even today, why doesn't George Bush, if he believes in the war on drugs, pick up the Kerry Commission report, committee report, and send it out to the American people. Why aren't five million copies distributed? Well, they'd the have to cut the uh, Contras off. They'd have to close they'd the They'd have Contras to cut Daniel down. Murphy off. And these are Bush's pets. Bush has been deeply involved in his Contra operation. It, it's the greatest reading. Yeah. It's the funniest reading. There's a 500-pound arms dealer in Miami, an Armenian <laughs> guy. He weighs 500 pounds. He has a huge palace on the grounds of the Miami Air International Airport. When Daniel Murphy wanted to borrow a plane to go to see Narrett Noriega, he goes to see the arms dealer. And the arms dealer says to him, and, th and both of them testify to this in the Kerry Commission. Murphy is a, n has no qualms about testifying. The arms dealer says to him, uh, well, last time I loaned you the plane. This time I can lend it to you, but you've got to pay for the gas. Well, you know, it's a, it's a four-engine plane, so the gas <laughs> is four or $5,000. So Murphy takes it down to Panama, sees Noriega, and he's got a business guy with him, and then they, they fly back. Now, could this have nothing? Of course, Murphy was number two in the South Florida Drug Task Force under George Bush. This is 1982. How could he do that, you know? You'd think that some reporter somewhere would write an article about it. Nobody said anything. The Panamanians said nothing. We said nothing. And the more we talk about a free press, they're free to advertise. They're free to sell. But they don't print like a free press. They don't publish like a free press. And you could say to me, well, if you don't like this country, why don't you go somewhere else? Well, this is my country. And uh, I love this country. I may despise its government. I may despise the CIA and the FBI. But this is my country. I would like somebody, I wish somebody had said at that moment, this is time to do something about the drug world, starting with Daniel Murphy, maybe with George Bush, surely with the arms dealer, and surely with the guy who flew the airplane. And the Contras. And the Contras, and all the rest of the, and the CIA, right. and all the rest right. of that wretched machinery. But uh, no, that becomes our real government. And that brings us to the end of another Alternative Views, our 396th program. We frequently hear from viewers who request a list of news publications which we use on Alternative Views and also a reading list for U.S. power structure in the mass media. If you would like to have these, send a stamped, self-addressed envelope to the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. You must send a self-addressed stamped envelope because we just can't afford the postage. We don't only get about three or five thousand dollars a year to run this program. We'd like to thank the people who helped make this program possible. Eric Eubank and Kevin West were our crew for our interview. Rob Whittison was the editor. We'd also like to thank Austin Community Television, ACTV. Alternative Views is a production of the Alternative Information Network. P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. Bye.